I think we should all worship with the same zeal that Easton has this morning. What do you think? <laughs> and if he can worship like that now, imagine how it's going to be when he can talk. I mean, that's going <laughs> to But, you know, God does something in us, even as children. And I saw that in my children as well, that something that we can't always explain, that he calls us to worship. His spirit does that um, because he created us to be close to him. And so I don't know about you, but I think it's exciting to see that in a child, even if he doesn't understand it. And so um, what a wonderful time of praise and worship. Well, we've been studying Second Samuel for the last few months here. And uh, just, to, just to do a little recap for you, you might remember that First and Second Samuel were actually all one book. Do you remember why it's divided into two books? Because of the scroll length. The scrolls weren't long enough to hold the whole thing, so they divided it in half, right? But it's actually one whole story that goes from 1 Samuel to the end of 2 Samuel. And so I'm excited that we're about to finish that journey. And what this book does is it takes us in the story of Israel through the time, from the time where they were led by prophets and judges to the time when they were led by kings. And that was a big change for Israel. And, and you remember God's preference was them, for them to be led by judges who he had chosen and put into place. But the people of Israel said, no, 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 we want a king because everybody else has got a king. We'd really like a king. And God said, okay, I'll give you a king, but it's not going to be great. And they said, that's okay, give us a king. And so then God chose their kings for them, not to punish them. He chose kings to bless them, knowing, though, that it wasn't the ideal system to set up. And so what we saw then in 1 Samuel was how Saul became the first king of Israel and how David grew up under Saul's leadership, um, worshiping with him and playing music for him and then serving as his military commander and all this, and then becoming a rival. Um, even though David didn't mean it that way, Saul saw him as a threat. Um, but David was careful not to do anything to hurt what he, whom he called the Lord's anointed because God had chosen Saul to be king. And David waited and it wasn't until Saul then died on the battlefield that David took his place as king. And so um, that is kind of where Second Samuel picks up, is in the leadership of David and him coming to the throne. And then we know that he actually led Israel as their king for 40 years. 40 years is a long time to be in a position of leadership. And, um, and so we saw David go through a lot of ups and downs in that time. And we can also read about what was on his mind and his heart when we read the Psalms and we can see the ones that he wrote. And you see that he had this amazing love for the Lord. And when he was close to God, God helped him to be victorious and they walked together. But when he turned his back on God, things didn't go so good, right? And so there are a lot of lessons then that we've taken with us throughout this study. Last week, we finished in chapter 20, and we read about how David was coming back to the throne because his son Absalom had tried to take the throne over and um, led this whole rebellion thing. And then after that was squashed, then this other guy named Sheba came and tried to, to take over as well. And so David put an end to that right away. Right away. And, um, and so then we saw David again sitting on the throne like he's supposed to be because he was God's choice. And what Absalom and Sheba didn't know, was, didn't realize, was that God had not chosen them to be king. That there's a lot of times when we think something makes sense to us, but if it's not God's plan, we shouldn't expect it to succeed, right? And so that, that was not God's choice. It was Absalom's choice and Sheba's choice, and they both lost their lives because of that. But now we see David back on his rightful throne. And the cool thing about David's reign is how it's, he's led it other than that through a time of peace. So when he first came into, um, into power, he fought all the enemies and he took over more land than Israel had ever had, more than they have today. And, um, and he put their enemies down. And so some of their enemies became allies and others became servants to them and others just kind of went away, right? But there was this time of peace in Israel 
and for the most part, a time when the tribes of Israel were united as one nation. So this was a really impressive thing that David did. Um, and after the rebellions had been set, pushed down, then we see that the tribes are united again. And so they are there as one. Well, that brings us then to the last four chapters of Second Samuel. And, um, and the, these remaining chapters are unusual because they're not in chronological order. And so, you know, a lot of times when we read the Bible, we expect it to be in order, and then you're like, this makes no sense whatsoever. And this is one of those parts. That, so what they think is that these last four chapters of 2 Samuel are actually like an appendix. Like somebody is writing the story of what has happened. They're chronicling the events of David's leadership and his rule. And then they get to the end, and they're like, Oh, and another thing happened. Oh, and there was also this. And oh, here were these people, right? And so they put these four chapters in as an end to the story that's run through this whole book and as kind of a bridge to what's about to happen in 1 Kings. So 1 Kings is the next book to come. And so if you were reading ahead in those four chapters and you're like, why is this here? That's why. It was just stuck there um, and we're not meant to read it in order. So we're not going to read through all four of these books because that would take quite some time. And also because some of it's kind of a downer, you know, and I'm a little tired of that. I don't know about you, but this has been a hard, hard book, right? But let me just give you an account of what happened, and then you can go back and read it in your, in your free time, okay? All right. First, there is an account of a famine that happened throughout the land, and, um, and people in Israel were dying, and they were starving, and they were not prospering. And so um, David made uh, sure that justice was brought about because of a wrong that had been done during Saul's reign, it appears. And David came back and made it right, and when he did, the famine went away. So that was his attempt to make the nation, uh, hold the nation accountable to God to do the right thing. And, and apparently that worked. Then there's also this account of a military census that David took. And you find this at the end of the book. And, and so he sent people out to take account of all the able-bodied men who could fight in the military and that kind of thing. Well, that was not something that God had told him to do. And as a matter of fact, it was offensive to God. And I don't know, maybe you're thinking like me, there's other times when the census was okay. Why is this offensive? Well, it was offensive because it was a sign that David was relying on people as his military strength instead of relying on God. And so he wanted to count the people to show how strong and mighty he and his people were. It was like a sign of pride instead of a sign of trust. And, um, and so God gave him them choices. He's like, God said, you sinned, and there's going to be a consequence to that. And he actually let David choose the consequence. And David chose a plague because the plague was short and also under God's control versus choosing things that other men could have a part in. But then when, um, so then David, as a part of that plague, then he bought this threshing floor from a man who was working his um, harvest, and he built an altar on that threshing floor, and all of this happened. Um, he offered sacrifices and offerings in response to his repentance for doing the wrong thing, and so God brought an end to the plague. Now, here's a cool thing about that, that threshing floor where he built an altar would later become the temple that his son Solomon would build. That's the site on which it would be built, um, which is kind of a cool thing, I think. So anyway, you have this famine and this plague, and in between those two then, there's a couple of different things. There is um, a song of praise from David, which is a lot like one of his psalms. We're not even sure when that happened. Some of them think it was written like after he was running from Saul, but there's this song of praise. And then there's also this list of David's mighty men. And so you might have heard about David's mighty men before. And, and so there's this whole, like most of a chapter on his mighty men and who they were and how many Philistines they slayed and, and how powerful they were. And, um, and that's a pretty cool list if you go back and look at it in greater detail. Um, but it's, it's also, you know, kind of wild because it's all about how, um, how powerful they were in war and how successful they were in war. So David had surrounded himself with these mighty warriors who, um, who fought on behalf of Israel. 
So in between then this song of praise and the list of mighty men, we have one more section of scripture. And that's what we're going to focus on today because that section is called the king's last words. And so we're, I think it's important for us to see what the king's last words would be, right? And this, these are not like his last words ever, because when you read into kings, you'll see him talking with his family, right? But these are, this is his last public address to the people of Israel. And I want you to think about it for a minute. If you were going to have one last chance to say something, what would you say? What would you tell people? about yourself or about God or about them? What do you think they would want to hear from a king? And I think that makes these words from David very important for us to see because he had some important things to say. And we're going to find this in um, 2 Samuel in chapter 23. And we're just going to be looking at the first seven verses. These are the king's last words. And, but there's a cool thing before we start reading it that I want to point out. If you were with us when we were studying 1 Samuel, he's still worshiping, isn't he? <laughs> if you were with us when we started 1 Samuel, maybe you'll remember that it started with a woman named Hannah. And you remember Hannah wasn't able to have children, and she desperately wanted a child. And so she went to an altar, and she prayed, and God gave her a child. And that child was Samuel, right? Okay, and then, then you see Hannah's song. There's a, a prayer that she says after that. And so that, that song, if you go back and look at it, is important not just for Hannah but for Israel because it talks about their need for a king and the need for peace to come to Israel. And so let me, let me just read that for you. I'm going to read just a passage of it. It's in 1 Samuel chapter 2. I'm just going to read verses 6 through 10. She said, this is Hannah's prayer of praise. The Lord gives both death and life. He brings some down to the grave, but raises others up. The Lord makes some poor and others rich. He brings some down and lifts others up. He lifts the poor from the dust and the needy from the garbage dump. He sets them among princes, placing them in seats of honor. For all the earth is the Lord's, and he has set the world in order. He will protect his faithful ones, but the wicked will disappear in darkness. No one will succeed by strength alone. Those who fight against the Lord will be shattered. He thunders against them from heaven. The Lord judges throughout the earth. He gives power to his king. He increases the strength of his anointed one. Now, isn't it cool looking back and reading that? How much do you see a lot of David in that? Right, That his strength came from the Lord and not himself. That he would come into the darkness and make the wicked go away. David is the anointed one that she was talking about in that prayer of praise. And now then we can go to 2 Samuel to David's last words and see how he describes himself. Okay, Because these are the last words of David. He says, David... The son of Jesse speaks. David, the man who was raised up so high. David, the man anointed by the God of Jacob. And David, the sweet psalmist of Israel. This is how David remembers himself. This is how he presents himself. And look at what's important about that. Because first of all, he acknowledges that he's the son of Jesse. And and everybody kind of can identify themselves by who they came from, right? But in this case, there's something worth noting because Jesse was rather obscure when it comes to history. He didn't do anything significant. He was just a guy who had a bunch of sons. Do you remember? Now, he was a member of the tribe of Judah, but he was relatively unknown. And he was from one of the least respected towns, which was Bethlehem. So, 
So David came from the town of Bethlehem, and he was the youngest son of his father, Jesse. And the youngest son usually had no, nobody paid attention to the youngest, right? I mean, I can relate to that. I'm the youngest in my family. There are no pictures of me whatsoever, right? You know, the first child comes and the whole house is decorated in him, right? But by the time the fourth child comes, then it's like, oh, that's just one more, you know, (laughs) right? So Jesse had all these sons, and even when Samuel went to him and said, I need to anoint the next king, he's like, oh, here's my sons, you know, and he went through all of his sons, and then he's like, um, do you have any more sons? And he was, Jesse said, well, yeah, I've got this one more. He's out tending the sheep. Well, go get him, and he brings him in, and God says, that's the one. So what David is saying here by saying, I am the son of Jesse, is to say, I came out of nothing. I'm a nobody. But God raised me up. And so he says he was the one who was raised up so high. All of Israel knew who David was. All of their enemies knew who David was. Do you think he was lifted high? He went from obscurity to fame. And it says David, the man anointed by the God of Jacob. He was the anointed one that Hannah spoke about. He was also the one chosen to lead them into battle and to lead them to victory. David was the anointed one. And then finally, he was the sweet psalmist of Israel. And indeed, he wrote so many of the psalms that became the soundtrack, not only of Israel, but of the Jewish nation to follow and of Christians today. A lot of the songs that we sing are taken from psalms that were written by David, aren't they? And what's so powerful about those is the trust of God that he had and the love for the Lord that was shown in all of those songs. This is the person that God chose to lead Israel. Now let me read on into verse 2 because this, this, this goes on. His last words go on to address who the Lord is. And he says, the spirit of the Lord speaks through me. His words are upon my tongue. The God of Israel spoke. The rock of Israel said to me, the one who rules righteously, who rules in the fear of God, is like the light of morning at sunrise, like a morning without clouds, like the gleaming of the sun on new grass after the rain. You see, David acknowledges that it was God who spoke through him, that it wasn't him. These were not his ideas. He was following the leadership of the Lord who spoke to him. And David walked in a relationship with God that was so close that he could hear from God. That God would tell him what to do and what to say, and he would do it. So he wasn't acting independently. And I love this about David because what he's saying is, it's not me. I'm not all that. It was God. Every success that we accomplished was because of God. Every word that I said that struck the hearts of a nation came from God, not from me. God is the one who was responsible. And then he goes on to give us this great lesson in leadership. The one who rules righteously, who fears who rules in the fear of God will be like a light shining into the darkness. Do you see that? And that's what God told David. If you want, the, if you want me to bless Israel, then you lead in a righteous way. Righteous meaning right with God, right? And as long as David walked with God, he was like the light of the sun breaking through into the darkness. Israel had been in the promised land for over 400 years at that point, and they had been at war the whole time. They, it had been a struggle from the day they crossed over, right? They had gone through so many battles, and there was darkness all around them. And in came David to shine the light of God on them because he was walking with the Lord. They had prospered and been fruitful under David's rule. Not because David was all that again, but because the God of Jacob was with him and he was working through him. And David sees the blessings that have come to his household because of this work with the Lord. And so 2 Samuel goes on to say, is it not my family God has chosen? Yes, he has made an everlasting covenant with me. His agreement is arranged and guaranteed in every detail 
and he will ensure my safety and success. But the godless are like thorns to be thrown away, for they tear the hand that touches them. One must use iron tools to chop them down, and they will be totally consumed by the fire. God had made a covenant with David that as long as David and his family walked rightly with him, then the king would always come from his family. But he also made sure that David understood that those who turned away from God would be destroyed. God's promises were not there as a blanket covering everybody, no matter what they did. They were for those who walked with him in righteousness. And this is the nature of God's covenant with Israel. And so do you remember way back in with Moses and in, in Exodus and all that? And, and God said, I want to be your God and I want you to be my people. And the people said, I, we want to be your people and we want you to be our God. And then God said, okay, do it my way and I will be your God, right? So it was a covenant, an agreement between the nation of Israel and the God of Israel. And that covenant came with a lot of promises and blessings, but it also came with a lot of expectations because God is a jealous God and he doesn't handle it well when, well, he handles it fine, but not according to us sometimes when we make somebody else the God instead of him, when we make ourselves the God instead of God. That's when we get into trouble. And so this covenant has been there in place all along. And then God speaks to David and he says, I'm going to make this covenant with you. That if you and your family will lead according to my ways, then the king will always come from your seed. And that was an everlasting covenant. But God also cautioned, if you turn away from me, if you become like a thorn, if you want to do it your way instead, if you want to tear at the hand that blesses you, then destruction will come. And indeed, isn't that how it is for all of us? That when we want to do things our way, when we decide to live in rebellion instead of doing things God's way, destruction comes. Has anybody here ever seen that in your life or others? I have. When I do it my way, things get really messed up. But when I do it God's way, he blesses it. <coughs> and that's what we saw in the life of David. David didn't always get it right. Would you acknowledge that? He messed up sometimes. And when he did, Israel paid dearly. But when he got it right, when he listened to God, when he followed what God said, then the nation was blessed more than they had ever been before and more than they would ever be again. God's blessings poured out on his people. And the cool thing about David was that when he got things wrong, he repented right? And so when he got things wrong, his heart was broken over it, and he would come back to God and say, I am so sorry. And God would forgive him, right? And that's, that would lead to his restoration in relationship with God. And it is the same way with us, that there are times when we can all have the capacity to make a mistake to do it wrong, to get it our way instead of his way. And when that happens, then the call of God is to repent and come back to him so that his blessings can flow again. Now, there's one other thing that I want to talk about that makes this passage so significant because you're like thinking, well, that's cool. There's the story of David all wrapped up in seven verses, right? But there's something more powerful about these verses that I want you to see, and that is that they are not about David. They are not just about David. They are also about Jesus. Because you see, Jesus would come later. But David set the course for what that would look like and what he would look like. And let me just show you some comparisons. Jesus was born in the insignificant town of Bethlehem, wasn't he? To parents that nobody knew. And in fact, the people that knew David, uh, Jesus' parents probably thought they were scandalous right? But they were still from the tribe of Judah. Jesus came to earth humbly as a baby, yet God raised him up to be the Lord of lords and King of kings. Even his death on the cross was a way of Jesus being lifted up 
he was lifted up high so that everybody could see him. Nobody in Jerusalem didn't know what was going on that day. Nobody knew that he didn't die on the cross. Jesus was there for all to see. And here's the other thing. Jesus was the anointed one. And you know what the word is for anointed one? Christ. Jesus was the Christ. He was the, God, the one that God anointed to do his work. And his heart was committed to the Father. And so do you see how Jesus was like David in those ways? Here's another way that they were alike. Because God spoke to the world through Jesus. Just as he had done through David. Jesus himself said, I don't speak on my own authority. The Father who sent me has commanded me what to say and how to say it. That's in John 12. And then in John 14, he goes on to say, The words I speak are not my own, but my Father who lives in me does his work through me. Jesus came to be our king and he rules righteously, then and now, doing what the Father told him to do. There was never any sin in Jesus. He always did what God told him to do. And he is the light of heaven that came into the dark world to set us free. And so you see, he is a just and righteous ruler. And under Jesus' rule, there are blessings that come out of that. Because of Jesus then, we can become a part of that everlasting covenant with God. And so David had an everlasting covenant with God, but through Jesus, all of us can have that same everlasting covenant. It says that his agreement is arranged and guaranteed in every detail. And that's what it said about David, and that's what it says about Jesus. When we put our faith in Jesus, we become citizens of a kingdom. Did you know that? Our admission price has already paid, been paid. That is the sacrifice that Jesus made. He did that for you so that when you put your faith in him, you could become a part of the nation of God. And our Father invites us to come and be a part of that. He wants us to be filled with his spirit sealed with his love and confident of his hope, looking forward to the thrones that we will occupy alongside him. Do you remember that from Revelation? It said that after we die, that we will go to the throne room, right? That we get to sit in the throne room with Jesus, right? That's, that's the people of Jesus having a claim to the throne, just like David's family had a claim to the throne, right? And that's for all of us. And you know how long it lasts? Forever. Forever. We are a part of an everlasting covenant brought to us through Jesus. And so you see, the study of David is really important because it sets us up for the expectation that Israel had for the, the Messiah that was coming. And ever since David stopped reigning, they kept looking for the new David. They were looking because it was promised. God said the king would come through his line forever. And so they were looking for him. But they missed him. They didn't see the similarities. And let me just tell you, David was a shepherd, right, who tended his father's flock. Jesus is the shepherd who tends his father's flock. But that's us, right? David was a deliverer of Israel. He delivered them out of the hands of their enemies, saving them and bringing them to a place of peace. Jesus is our deliverer, our Savior. He rescues us from our enemies. And he delivers us from the grips of sin that threatens to destroy us. Because we can look at Israel and say, I'm not held captive like they are. But do you know what? We can be held captive right here. But we're captive to our sins. We're captive to an enemy who wants to prey on us. We are captive to a world that wants to convince us we don't need to live for Jesus. But Jesus comes in and sets us free. He is our deliverer. And David was the anointed king, chosen by God to bring unity to his people. 
David didn't lord over his subjects. He loved his nation and he sought to lead them justly. Jesus, in the same way, is our king who loves us and wants to lead us along the path of righteousness. He is the one who brings us into the heavenly realm where peace and joy reign, not just in heaven, but here and now too. If Jesus is Lord of your heart and the one that you truly follow, then you know what it's like to experience that peace and that joy that only comes from him. David was the greatest king that Israel would ever know, but he was human. He was flawed. He wasn't perfect. But the Christ who would come after him the anointed one who would still hold a heart for the Lord and a heart for God's people was on the way. And Jesus was perfect in every way. He never sinned. He never gave in to the enemy. He never thought it was about him. It was always about the Father's work. And in doing all of that, he became the perfect representation of God on earth so that we might know what God looks like. And here it was, here's what he said in Revelation 22. He said, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to give you this message for the churches. That was the message he gave to John, you remember? He said, here's the message. I am both the source of David and the heir to his throne. I am the bright morning star. So you see, Jesus confirmed it himself. I'm the one. I'm the one who was promised. When God said to David, your, your family will always have the seed of the king, God wasn't lying. He didn't give up on his promise. He made it true. That seed was Jesus. And Jesus said, I was here before him, and I'm here after him. I was the source of David, and I am the heir of David's throne. But more than that, I am the bright and morning star, which is just what David had said, wasn't he? The light that pierces into the dark like the morning sun shining on the grass with dew, right? That's who the morning star is. It's Jesus. It's Jesus. He is the light who never stops shining. He is the one who extends open hands to everybody who is ready to step out of the darkness and into the light. That's what Jesus does. That's who he is. He is our bright and morning star. David may have brought peace to Israel, for, but for 400 years after that, they struggled. When Jesus brings peace to you, you don't have to struggle anymore. That doesn't mean hard times don't come. It just means that when those hard times do come, you are never alone. You don't have to walk through any of them. And hopefully what that means is when those dark times come and when the struggles come, it's not because of what you did. It's because we live in a fallen world where people need to know Jesus. Right? He is our bright and morning star. He wants to bring peace to you for eternity. And so, my friend, if you don't know him as your personal Savior, I want to invite you to know him today. I want you to know that there is hope for you, that you don't have to live in the chaos and the darkness anymore. You don't. But all of that is up to you. Because even as you sit there and consider, do I want to give my life to Jesus or not? You know what you're thinking? Well, I don't know if I want to give this up. And I don't know if I want to do this. And what would I say to so-and-so who wants me to do this other thing? Or what if it means I have to walk up to an altar and pray in front of people? And that would be embarrassing. Well, you see, then that makes your pride more important than your heart. Because Jesus said, can you just deny everything else and let me be your Lord? And when you do, let, let your life change. That's what he does. And it might not happen overnight just because you made a prayer, right? It happens over time. It happens as you grow, as you thrive, as you learn to grow up in that light. When a seed is planted in the sun, it doesn't come up the next day, right? It grows and it strengthens and it grows closer and closer to the light as you go. And that's what it looks like to give yourself to Jesus. So today we're going to go back into a time of prayer and worship. And what I want to do is invite you that if you don't really know him as that peace-bringing morning star in your life, today could be the day when it all changes. If you want to come to an altar and pray, this would be the day. 
you could walk out of here today knowing that your life is different, that your course has changed, that you have the king of kings on your side. And, and there might still be a lot of problems out there, but you can know that you won't walk into those problems alone because the Lord of Lords will walk with you. And as you walk righteously and justly with him, his blessings will pour out. Wait and see. Wait and see. And so we're going to go into a time of prayer. And I invite you to bow your heads with me. Let's pray. Father God, you knew what you were doing when you sent your son, Jesus. It was your plan all along. And how amazing it is, God, that even as King David would deliver his last words, whether he knew it or not, he was speaking about a king that was yet to come. About the king that would rule over us. Not because we are his subjects, but because we are dearly loved. And so, my God, I pray that if there is anyone here who doesn't know Jesus as their personal Savior, life-changing, hope-giving, way-making Savior, that today would be the day they ask you into their hearts and that their new eternity would begin. Over and over again, your word says the wicked will be thrown into the fire. We don't want to have that fire on us, Lord. Help us to turn away from that. Thank you that, that when, when we mess up, that when we are the wicked ones, Lord, that you call us back into relationship through Jesus, that we can lay it down at your feet and say, I'm sorry, just like David did. I'm sorry, Lord, for the times I let you down, but I want to live for you. And so I pray, God, that that's, that's our hearts today, that everyone here, Lord, would have hearts that are turned towards you and that this would be the beginning of a bright new day for somebody. We pray these things in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. If you would stand.